McQuistian for over 28 years talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistian is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the Hatton W. Sumner's Foundation, helping to educate the public about the fundamental principles of their democracy and thus be in a position to help formulate public policy. The University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future. Well, hello, I'm Dennis McQuistion, and I don't have to tell you that the issue of China has been on the front burner of all of us for the last few months and the last few years. And we've done a lot of programs on this topic. And Jim, we're going to do another one here with a, an outstanding guest. So why don't you tell that viewer who we've got to talk to? about today. I'll do that. And you're absolutely right, Dennis. I think we could schedule a, a full calendar, of, uh, a full year of programs on U.S.-China relations this year. In fact, uh, just a, a few days ago, I saw William Burns in his confirmation hearing to be director of the CIA. And he said this, the adversarial predatory Chinese leadership poses our biggest geopolitical test. And so I'm so happy that we have with us today, David Farstein. He's the inaugural president and CEO of the George H.W. Bush uh, Foundation for U.S.-China Relations. In fact, it is the only U.S. think tank that focuses solely on U.S.-China relations. Uh, David has a rich diplomatic career, 30 years. He's also an author of a number of books and articles on China. And to top it all off, get this, he is considered the world's best non-native speaker of Mandarin Chinese, probably won a lot of competitions. David, thank you so much for being with us. Jim, thanks so much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate it, David. And as um, you know, with that short introduction that Jim gave you, which is what we always have to do is to shorten those introductions. But I encourage that viewer to look at David's incredible bio online. And David, I'm quite sure that the views you're going to give us today, the perspective that you're going to put in place came about because of some things. Give us a little bit of that background about how you developed your interest in China and then how your perspectives may have changed and evolved over the last few years. Well, thank you so much. And it's such a pleasure to be with you. And, you know, my story with China goes back uh, well over 35 years. Uh, when I was um, uh, between my sophomore and junior years of high school, I had the opportunity to travel to China with my parents uh, on our family's first ever visit to East Asia. And we went to China as well as a few other countries in the region. And uh, as a 16 year old, uh, I just became really fascinated with, uh, with China and with this part of the world. It was a part of the world I didn't know anything about really. And it really opened my eyes to, um, to the idea that you know, there's this other half of the globe that is really interesting, really different from us, really important. And I had a hunch in 1984 as a high school student that China was just going to be more and more important to the United States and to the world. And I got very interested in the uh, possibility of studying China uh, in college. And I did that uh, in the context of my work on international relations. And my aspiration was to join the U.S. Foreign Service and to have the opportunity to work on U.S.-China relations, including at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. And I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. So uh, I've been dealing with China now for nearly 37 years uh, and uh, professionally for about 30 years. And it is an incredible country uh, and one that has changed almost in a way that's incomprehensible uh, over these last several decades. And there's a lot that one can sink one's teeth into. And I, it's been both interesting and at times challenging, uh, but always, uh, but never a dull moment, I would say, in terms of my, my work on China. David, how many years have you lived in China? Uh, all in all, I have lived in China probably about six years. Uh, about uh, five of those years uh, were years that I was in Beijing uh, at the U.S. Embassy as a U.S. diplomat. But I also spent time there as a student and graduate student. All told, it's about six years. And, you know, you've, you've touched on this, but your, your, your views on China must really have evolved because you've seen it go through such a transformation. How have your perceptions changed? Uh, the China of the year 2021 is very different 
from the China of the year 1984 or 1987 when I traveled there as a college student or 1989 when I was there as an undergraduate student for a semester. And so I, I have these interesting points of reference uh, sort of keyed to different periods of Chinese history. But I think the one through line, Jim, is that um, whereas in the 1980s, I had the perception that in China, most people didn't feel that their destiny was theirs to control. Uh, over the years and by the 1990s, I came to the conclusion that more and more Chinese were feeling that far more aspects of their lives were within their power to shape than had been the case even a decade before that. And that's probably been one of the most interesting and significant transformations that I've seen in the Chinese mindset uh, during the period that I've engaged with China. Can you give that viewer just a short perspective of, of the big event that happened in 89 and particularly your perspective on it since you were a student at the time? Yes, well, I, I was a student at Peking University uh, in, the, year, in the, the first half of the year, 1989, the spring semester. And it happened to be exactly the time that the student movement uh, of 1989 unfolded. It started on April 15th on the campus of Peking University, where I was a student. And uh, it continued until June 4th, 1989, uh, when the student movement came to a tragic end uh, as the Chinese government uh, uh, decided to use force to bring an end to these demonstrations. And uh, it was an incredible time to be in China. The memories of that period uh, have always remained with me. And basically what you had were um, in April and May of 1989, hundreds of thousands of students and others from across Beijing uh, marching and carrying banners and saying that there were certain things uh, that they wanted in their country, what we in the United States might call uh, First Amendment rights and greater freedoms and greater ability to uh, be involved in the political process, democracy, and so on. And they took to the streets in massive numbers, and it was uh, something to behold. And uh, you know, I'll never forget those images. Um, and I think you know, you're right that after the events of, 19, uh, of June 4th, 1989, when the government uh, used force to suppress uh, and ultimately to shut down these demonstrations uh, at the cost of a lot of life uh, in China, uh, a lot of innocent life, um, ultimately, uh, immediately thereafter, there was an effort to essentially uh, remove uh, discussion of uh, these events from the history books, from public discourse. And I think the point, Dennis, that you made about the fact that very few people today really know what happened uh, during that period of time is accurate. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, that history is not better known to many uh, in China, but that is certainly the case. So. Those are some indelible memories. Um, and uh, one of the points during the course of my engagement uh, with China and my history with China uh, that left a very deep impression on me and helped formulate my thinking about China and my understanding about Chinese politics and Chinese society. David, I want to bring you back to something you said a minute ago. And that was that, in a sense, now China is feeling, Chinese people feel that they can have more control over their lives. And yet, is that not sort of a disconnect from where we are with the Chinese Communist Party? Well, um, the question is a good one, but the way that you square the circle is that if you think back to where China was in the 1980s and certainly before that, you have to remember that virtually every decision that a Chinese uh, person would encounter along the course and the journey of their life was essentially a decision where they didn't necessarily have the primary decision-making role. Uh, the decision was in the hands of people other than themselves. So if you were um, going to school, you didn't really have a choice of where to go to school. You went where you were supposed to go. Uh, the issue of college, it was extremely competitive to get in. And you couldn't just kind of whimsically decide your major. Your major was going to be decided for you based on your test scores. When you finished college, if you went to college, then uh, where you worked was going to be something that was decided for you uh, in the unit system. You'd be assigned to a work unit, as it was called at that time. And that wasn't a choice that you got to make. You were essentially assigned somewhere and had relatively little latitude, if any, to shape that decision. Same thing for your housing. And also, for that matter, a lot of societal pressure on, on, on issues of marriage and when to start a family and uh, how large your family could be, whether you could travel overseas, 
and the list goes on. Just every major thing in a person's life was really decided by someone other than yourself. Um, and if you look at China in the 1990s, and certainly if you look at China in the year 2021, all of those things that used to be in the hands and, and within the decision-making authority of others, all of those decisions are now within the authority and the ability of an individual to make for him or herself. So where you go to school, whether you go overseas, what your job is, whether you quit that job and start a new job, where you get a house, if you don't like the house, when to sell and move to another house, how to design uh, the interior of your home, uh, whether to have kids, uh, and now a somewhat greater latitude in terms of the number of kids that you can have, at least relative to- you know, I, I, I hear you, things. but still we read about, you know, gross human rights violations and lack of ability for people to move necessarily from one province to another. And we have the situation with the Uyghurs. Yeah, well, so the point that I want to make is that it is it is a absolutely accurate to say that people have more ability to shape outcomes in their lives than they did some years ago. That's unquestionable. It is also true that China is a one-party authoritarian state. It was then and it is now. And there are certain freedoms that we in the United States, uh, we in the United States are blessed to have and that we enjoy that people in China don't have. Uh, in terms of the ability to uh, take part in meaningful elections that uh, produce uh, democratically elected leadership of our nation, in terms of uh, the, what we would call the First Amendment rights of freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, freedom of religion in the fullest sense, and the list goes on. That is also true. So both things are true, uh, Jim, at the same time. It's true that people have more latitude in their individual lives it is also true that they still lack many of the freedoms that we cherish in this country. And um, I think it would be incorrect to miss either sides of that picture. They're both true at the same time. And that's why people look at China and see um, a lot of complexity to the picture there. And, and oh, yeah. you know, right now we're seeing such a, a struggle, almost competition among think tanks and in the media about which direction the new Biden administration should go to, uh, whether it be containment like with the former Soviet Union or more engagement. How do you see it? Well, um, I think uh, I, I think where the Biden administration is, is that it sees China as a tremendously formidable national competitor which happens to be consistent with the framing that I've offered over the last several years. I've often referred uh, publicly to China as the most uh, formidable national competitor that the United States will ever have in the lifetimes of every American drawing breath today. Um, but it is also true at the same time, and I think the Biden administration recognizes this, that China is an indispensable partner to the United States, whether we like that fact or not, simply because of its size, the fact that it's the second largest economy in the world, that even after four years or three plus years of the trade war, it's still the third largest trading partner with the United States and the largest, if you discount the two that are bordering us, uh, it's the largest overseas trading partner by far. David, you're, I think you're exactly right. And I, I want you to give, uh, again, um, um, perspective. We've talked on this program with other uh, experts like you on China about really what, what happened over the last 20 years with the entry into the WTO and those trade issues and, and what we thought and what you and the uh, State Department and Diplomatic Corps thought was going to happen versus what has happened. So can you give us that perspective? Yeah, it's a great question, Dennis. Thank you. And um, yeah, I think to summarize the, the, the answer to your question, I think uh, certainly in the 1990s when I was in China and certainly predating that, and probably right up to the early 2000s, um, the general consensus within Washington, within the U.S. State Department, uh, among U.S. presidents of both political parties, was that the more we engaged China, uh, the, the likelier that China would, uh, in a sense, over some period of time, embrace our values and our norms and our ways of doing thing, uh, things and, our, and the international system and the mechanisms within the international system uh, that we um, that we embrace, and that frankly the United States largely created uh, in the in the wake of World War II, and I think what the realization that has um, that people have had over the last several years, and probably dating back maybe to about 2010 or so, one could debate what specific year to put on it, but approximately dating back about 10 or 12 years, is the realization that. 
uh, that assumption um, probably ends up being having been flawed. Uh, that, in fact, uh, China uh, over these years has not seemingly um, embraced uh, the the values and the norms and the ways of doing things that we had anticipated or hoped China would embrace, but in fact has kind of gone a different route. And so I think there's been a lot of disillusionment about that. Um, I think a lot of people, um, you know, feel a sense of frustration that the assumptions that we as a nation, many of us in the na in this nation had made, uh, uh, ended up being uh, dashed and being inaccurate. And now I think there's a realization that the United States needs to look at China with fresh eyes and understand China for the country that it is, for the system that it is, and to um, you know be clear-eyed about China and to address the challenges that China presents to the United States, which are many, but at the same time uh, to recognize that there are some things that we're gonna need to work with China on in order to generate effective solutions and I think getting that balance right now is, is, is where the discussion is in this country. How do we do that? How do we calibrate it? And how do we optimize the relationship now that we all realize that the earlier assumptions that the US government had made uh, proved to be inaccurate? So what assumptions do you think President Xi has about us? Nick Kristof of the New York Times recently described him as a, what did he say, an overconfident risk-taking bully. Um, you know, a lot of this is political rhetoric, but what do you think yeah. she really believes and what is he saying to his insiders? Well, um, my sense for the way that uh, President Xi and the Chinese leadership look at the United States is that is a couple of things. Number one, they recognize that the United States is their most formidable competitor. And I think they get that. They understand it. They understand that they are going to be locked in a major league competition with the United States, the world's only superpower, for the foreseeable future. Uh, sometimes Chinese public rhetoric doesn't give full expression to that sentiment, but I believe that sentiment exists in China, the notion that the United States is a formidable competitor. And I think there is a sense uh, in China that, uh, you know, that uh, the United States has gone through some difficulties in recent years and has stumbled in various ways. Uh, and has uh, overreached over a period of 10 or 15 or 20 years uh, in terms of our, interna uh, our international um, uh, efforts and initiatives, including the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and so on. And I think China is, uh, you know, looks very carefully at what the United States does and, and looks at our politics and looks at uh, the, uh, what has happened over the last several years in terms of our public discourse. Uh, yeah, in, in, and David, that, I, I think that, that's a great perspective. And you mentioned World Affairs, and you, you may or may not know that Jim Falk uh, was the head of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth for 20 years. He just retired yes. just recently. But one of the speakers he had here was Graham Allison, who wrote that book, Thucydides' Trap. And, and I think one of the things that Americans and our viewer in particular is concerned about, we did a program called uh, will America and China avoid war and and not can we? Obviously we can, but whether we will or not, I mean, how do you see the sort of military part of this? And, and we don't have a lot of time left. So give us their perspective on that, please. Well, a couple of things. Uh, so first of all, I, uh, I don't think the Thucydides trap is um, an, a real and operational dynamic in the relationship for one reason. Uh, the fact that both the United States and China possess intercontinental nuclear arsenals that can inflict catastrophic damage on the other uh, is the reason why the Thucydides trap construct doesn't apply and hasn't applied since World War II. There, the scholars that have looked at this phenomenon haven't seen a case of it since 1945. The reason is because uh, the major powers in the world have, that have nuclear weapons are not going to get into a war with each other. Uh, so I think there, there are limits to that basic uh, thesis. Um, I think that uh, the United States and China can and will avoid warfare. Uh, I don't see a major military conflagration uh, in the foreseeable future between the United States and China, but I do see um, uh, a closing uh, of the gap. There is still a significant gap between the United States and China, but I see that gap closing because China is certainly putting a lot of uh, investment into developing its military and its capabilities. The United States is as well, but China is kind of gaining. And so I think the power gap between the two countries is closing. Uh, the countries are uh, in, you know, 
come into tension with each other around a number of different issues, but I see a certain stability to that tension precisely because of how powerful the United States is and precisely because neither side, I think, believes, I yeah, think, I, believes I, I, that, I, that a war would be in their interest. Do I see China and India fighting a war over those issues? No, I don't see it. Have they in the past? Yes, so, several decades ago. And yes, there have been skirmishes much more recently than that. But a full-on war, I don't see it uh, because those issues ultimately are pretty manageable uh, in terms of the status quo. And while they're unresolved, they've been unresolved for decades and have not generally uh, generated conflagration during that period. So yes, there are things on China's borders that are issues that still need to be resolved or that may never be resolved. But as a, as a general matter, I just don't see much likelihood of major conflagration uh, erupting on the borders as a result of those outstanding issues. And of course, military is only one way to wage war. Talk with us in the few minutes that we have left about how China is very effectively using its economic clout to get its way. Well, I mean, China is the second largest uh, economy in the world. It's one of the largest markets in the world. It's probably the number one trading partner of, I believe, about two thirds of the countries in the world. And where it's not number one, it's probably in the top two or three for most of the rest of the countries as it is for us. So China matters, just like the US. Um, you know, we're big, powerful countries, big, powerful economies. Our markets are really substantial. And uh, the power of the market um, matters in, in, in the global economy. And so China, um, you know, definitely is aware of its size and its heft. Uh, and uh, it recognizes that countries are going to uh, and businesses are going to want to perform and, and be present in its market. And it certainly leverages that knowledge uh, and that influence uh, in ways that uh, it sees fit and sometimes in ways that we in the United States and many others see as problematic. But Yes, China is a hefty player in the global economy. And yes, sometimes it throws its weight around and sometimes we do too. David, I don't know if you know Luke. He is with the Oxford Institute for Energy, um, which is connected with Oxford University. And he recently wrote a book, uh, How China Loses. And one of the questions that I asked him was, how effective in what type of effort is China making in spreading, exporting its uh, ideology? Yeah. Well, look, I think China is very active in um, trying to inform and influence public opinion overseas in support of its foreign policy objectives. And that's called public diplomacy. And every country in the world engages in it. China does too. So do we. And it's not an inappropriate activity for a country to engage in. It is also true that some of the tactics and methods that China use, uses are uh, problematic from a US perspective. In some cases, they're heavy handed. Uh, in almost no cases are they illegal, by the way, which is one of the issues that we have to confront in an open society. Uh, but nevertheless, there are certainly concerning behaviors here and the United States is right to look at those behaviors. But the notion that a country, whether China, the United States or anyone else is going to go out and seek to inform and influence foreign public opinion in support of its own foreign policy objectives, that is not an unusual thing. And it's not something that is inappropriate for a country to do. If it were inappropriate, then we shouldn't be doing it either. You're, very, you're absolutely right, Jim. It's the fact that China has gotten a lot better at it than they were some years ago, just as you've rightly noted, that I think has kind of caused people in this country to come to the realization, wait a minute, China is now a serious player in this information space uh, and in the space of the contestation of ideas. But, you know, I will say, Jim, we competed with the Soviet Union in, in terms of the contestation of ideas, and we fared pretty well. And we fared pretty well because we were confident as a nation that our ideas were the right ideas. And what really concerns me about what we've seen over the last several years is the uh, evident loss of confidence on the part of our nation that somehow we can't beat China in a free contestation of ideas. I don't accept that. Uh, it seems like that we, we do diplomacy, they do propaganda. Isn't that about right? Uh, I don't know that I would say I'm it quite that. I'm not about that, but I'm just yeah, saying well, that's the way we see it, right? Yeah. It is the way we see it. And, and also, let me just pick up on that point and say, you know, when we do it, we call it soft power. When they do it, we call it sharp power. Uh, when we do it, we call it public diplomacy. When they do it, we call it influence operations. 
When we work with people, we call them valued partners. And when they work with people, we call them agents of the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, we've created an entire lexicon to, uh, to perpetrate the hypocrisy that, you know, influencing a foreign public is a bad thing to do. Yes, China does it in certain ways that we don't, and those ways are often problematic. However, the, the real problem is that under our constitution, China has the right to do almost everything that it's doing. And it begs the question, if you find a, quote, solution to this problem, the likelihood is that the solution is going to be a lot worse than the problem. That's why this continues to go on. David, how can the United States strengthen its relationship with China? Well, I think there are a few things that we can do in the immediate term. Um, uh, first of all, let, let's recognize that over the last four years, the U.S.-China relationship deteriorated really dramatically, and we really are at a modern era low, low water mark. And so I think to kind of get the relationship back on track, we need some confidence building measures that are achievable. Um, and some of those might include um, both sides getting rid of the tariffs that have hurt both economies, uh, restoring the consulates uh, general in Houston and in Chengdu, uh, opening up student visas again at one point uh, year over year from 2019 to 2020, it dropped the number of student visa, uh, visa issuances dropped 99% during one reporting period uh, in that time frame. There, there are things of this nature that I think we can do. Restoring the Fulbright program should be a no-brainer. Uh, it was terminated by President Trump. You know, things like this are doable. They're not, um, you know, difficult. Most of them were done unilaterally and can be undone unilaterally. And I think that would at least get things moving back in the right direction so that we can tackle the more challenging issues over a longer period of time. Thank you so much for being with us today, David. Uh, we appreciate uh, your comments. One thing here at the McQuiston program, we'd like to hear all different perspectives. And I'd like to remind everyone that you can follow Dennis and me by going to your favorite social media site. You can catch up on past programs by going to mcquistontv.com. And remember, we bring to you perspectives that matter to people who care. For more information, call 214-750-5157 or email Nikki N at NikkiMcQuistion.com. Visit our website at www.mcquistiontv.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at www.twitter.com slash TV or download McQuistion TV video podcast on iTunes. 